of cheap money is over, the era of tighter money is here for a prolonged period. What are you seeing from the most successful companies in terms of how they're navigating that transition? What are they doing? What are they putting in pl putting themselves in place in order to be prepared to be you know, one of the first out of the gate when that IPO window opens? When money was free, what we had was a small growth company losing money, getting the same cost of capital as Microsoft. And what we've seen play in evaluations now is that is passed. And so the valuation paradigm has changed where the cost of capital is now three to four times. So you've had the overall cost of capital, which we see in the public market shift up. But really for growth companies, we've seen it, you know, a multiplier effect in terms of how people are valuing. And so I think what that means is there's been just a shift in terms of not only growth at all cost, but growth of profitability. And so what people are looking at is, can this company scale? Can it provide sustainable growth over a period of time? And can it get to target markets that target you know, margins that show that they can generate cash flow? And I think those are the companies that are going to lead the way in the IPO market. The rise in cost of capital really impacts the buy side of the equation. So returns on deals in general fall. Um, and so the strategic logic to get a deal done from a buyer's perspective has to be much stronger than it was two or three years ago, which is why I think you've seen volumes in the M&A market fall pretty precipitously. And it's really a function of what I'll call the corporate buyer stepping out of the market for a moment in time. If you think about M&A, M&A is a risk on activity in a market that's been fundamentally risk off for 18 months or so. And, and part of that is just the return hurdle to create an acquisition case that gets through the boardroom has just become so much higher. You know, I think if we had said, starting at the beginning of the year, that the VIX would be at 14, you know, the NASDAQ would be up 20, 30%, S&P 500 would be up in double digits. Uh, I think most people would have thought, hey, we're gonna really loosen the capital markets. So what is, what is standing in the way right now? Is it just we need to get enough time of, uh, of the capital markets showing some strength and returns before people come into the market? Or is there something else that's holding back that IPO issuance? Because normally under these conditions, you'd expect things to be pretty good. It has not been a lack of demand. Uh, the reality is it does take boards time to pivot and adjust their strategy. And I think shifting that aircraft carrier on from a timing perspective is just a very slow process. But we have reached out this week to many of the tech companies in our IPO backlog saying, let's talk about what we're seeing, let's talk about green shoots in the market, and let's see whether there's a window for you this summer. Because certainly from the investor perspective, we're seeing demand for growth assets again. Not growth at all cost, but growth plus profitability, there's definitely a bid. The shifting composition of who, where the demand is coming from in the market, whether it's both for strategic activity or uh, demand for, for IPO issuance. Maybe talk through what you folks are seeing uh, in terms of you know, the M&A demand. How is that composition shifting? The last 18 months have really been a story of sponsors in the M&A market. So over the course of my career in tech, broadly defined, the overwhelming majority of M&A that got done by at least a volume basis was largely strategic activity. If you were to look at the tech deals that have gotten done over the course of the last 18 months, at least the public company M&A, 80% of it's been done by a financial sponsor. I cannot remember a time over the course of my career where that's been the case. I don't think in boardrooms of, of uh, strategics, I don't think we've seen a, a bigger appetite to be doing deals than right now. Uh, I think the appetite is there and they want to do it. I think the, the constraint has been um, one, value expectations on the side of the sellers. And then two, I think as Chris alluded to, the market, the lens of doing deals is, is uh, very harsh right now. You have to do deals that are going to be accretive out of the gates and people understand the strategic logic and are kind of centered down the fairway. <laughs> Vintec is a, is a very large umbrella. And so are there areas that you folks are seeing where there's specific investor interest? What are, you know, what are the hot areas? Well, what's, what's not hot uh, right now, which was, um, is uh, B2C, where B2C models were hot uh, uh, over the last couple of years. I think we've seen that taper down. That said, where people really want to play is B2B and infrastructure play. So we're seeing a lot of demand, whether it's wealth and capital markets tech, reg tech, um, whether it's embedded finance, whether it's B2B payments, 
all the things around, you know, providing software and capabilities and infrastructure. Uh, and again, it even plays into, it plays into when you think about B2C models, people are a lot more hesitant to play into a B2C, but they love to play into the infrastructure that powers the B2C. It's uh, hard to have a conversation about what's going on in, in capital markets without at least mentioning AI as a, as a driver of interest. If we go down a level below into the fintech space, what are you seeing as the impact for AI? All of the companies that we're working with, private and public, view this as an arms race as it relates to AI. We spent a ton of time in AI over the course of the past six months. Uh, we hired a new global head of AI investment banking uh, who was chief strategy officer at DataRobot. And so she's put us in front of a long list of, of private AI companies. We've also done a road show with sovereign wealth funds, pensions, and mutual funds, just getting their perspective on the AI investing landscape. Uh, what's interesting, having done 15 of those meetings, is the consensus feedback is great companies need to really understand the business plan and the economic model for each of them. And so in the interim, the best place to allocate capital to get exposure to AI without naming names is two or three of the biggest large caps, and you can see it reflected in their stock prices. From an M&A perspective, I would say all, all of the large corporates are trying to figure it out, fi figure out how AI fits into their fundamental business plan, what element of it's disruptive, what element of it accelerates their own roadmap. Um, I think most will probably look to acquire as opposed to build organically. I share Paul's view. It's, a, it's an arm race. And when it's an arm race, M&A tends to be the, the natural answer to do it quickly. Where I think folks are struggling as they look at various opportunities through an M&A lens is what, what's real AI versus what's, what's a buzzword in a PowerPoint deck. What are we not thinking about? You know, what, what's not in the sort of common consensus about how things are going to play out? The one simple thing I've learned in 22 years of doing this is everything is cyclical. So whenever there is a guaranteed one-way trade, all of these trades reverse at some point. And right now the big trade is long US, effectively short everything else. What we need to see is how that, how that ultimately plays out over the next few years. I would say the, the pace of activity that's happening under the surface is materially elevated versus where it was 12 months ago. Um, and so it gives me a high degree of conviction around what you'll see announced through the back half of the year and into, into next year. Um, the, the big question for a lot of folks is frankly a regulatory one.